Hi, I'm Neha Singh. Hi, I'm Abhishek Goyal. And uh, we are co-founders of Traction. Traction is a private market intelligence platform. We work with investors and large corporates who want to track the private markets, the startup landscape and the ever-changing emerging technology space. To a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. What this means is that your worldview depends on the kind of tools that you have. And my worldview was recently changed once I got access to a tool called Traction, which is spelled as T-R-A-C-X-N. Traction is basically like a Bloomberg for private markets. And let me break that down for you. Bloomberg is not just the name of a US presidential hopeful, but is a tool which has tons of data on publicly listed equities and mostly focused on the US. It is what every Wall Street analyst uses to make investment decisions. And I would say that billions of dollars of investment decisions are made using Bloomberg. Traction does the same, except it focuses on unlisted companies and it is used by VCs and angel investors and the likes. And this is how Traction affected my worldview. Every time I would see an ad for a D2C brand on Instagram, I would first look them up on Traction to see how much money had they raised, what kind of top line were they doing, and what kind of valuation were they at to decide really that is this a big company or is it a relatively young newcomer. Every time I saw a job ad in my alumni mail group, I would look up that company on Traction to see what has been the growth of people in the company and how have they been doing revenue wise essentially traction has tons of data which can be used to make a whole host of decisions abhishek and neha the founders of traction were working as analysts in some of india's leading venture capital funds when they felt the need for a platform that would make it easier to build up the basic profiles of companies that they were potentially looking to invest in and over the next decade they built up traction to a company which tracks millions of companies across the world today and despite being based completely in India, gets most of its revenue from the globe. It's really a made in India for the world example and they are headed for an IPO soon. Listen on to my conversation with Abhishek and Neha about the journey of building up this amazing business. You're listening to the Founder Thesis podcast and I'm your host Akshay Dutt. And post that, I did my undergrad at IIT Bombay in computer science and initially joined BCG, the Boston Consulting Group, and then Sequoia Capital. For me, so the idea of traction got born in when I was investing. And I thought that if you look at public market investors, they have the luxury of having platforms like Bloomberg or a Facet or a Capital IQ. While if you are a private market investor, when you're looking at different sectors, you literally have to build the whole stack yourself. Uh, So the uh, subtraction was born by uh, a need that I really wish that a platform like this existed when we were investors. uh, At uh, at Sico, what exactly were you doing? Was there a segment in which you were investing or what was your role there? So I was investing primarily in tech. And this was a decade back in 2010 when everyone was not looking at tech. Like today, if you look at it, most investors would be looking at tech as such. But at that time, it was a smaller team. And then you would look at like typical healthcare, financial services, etc. So I was looking at primarily tech startups in India. And can you give me some names? What kind of companies did you invest in or even companies that you regret passing on? (laughs) Yeah. So there were a bunch of interesting companies. For instance, Precharge was one company that I had worked on. Racto was when we were, I was part of the TA team when we had written the first seed check. Obviously, it's great to see the company scale so much. Some of the companies that I, you know, I, that I had seen very closely, which should not portrait to have been invested in. For instance, Browser Stacks was a very interesting company, which was actually started by seniors of my from IIT Bombay. So I knew them beforehand and then I heard about that they're doing very interesting work. But unfortunately, yeah, obviously that company has done tremendously well. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. Abhishek, what's your retraction journey? Like, and where did you meet Neha? So I joined, my first job was Yahoo and then I also worked with Amazon. So these are all tech Like software, you were coding basically. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I was not 
the best programmer I knew, but I that was where I spent few years. And then at 20, I was among the youngest CTO in my batch. So I became a CTO at 26. So I managed to be wow. people. Wow. And, Which company? CTO? This was actually a division uh, of 3i Infotech where we were like running a BU and I was head of the technology there. And uh, I always thought that I wanted to do leadership roles and entrepreneurship. And after which, actually after Amazon, I joined Axel. So this was 2008 to 10. I spent three years there. And during Axel, one of my claim to fame is that I helped them lead the seat on Flipkart. So you became an investor from being a CTO. Yes. Why it's such a drastic shift? I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I always used to read about startups and all of that. And one of my colleagues at Amazon was funded by Excel. And they recommended me. I was leaving a to start a startup and then they recommended me to meet them. They said they do investing. And I met them casually. It was not a job hunt. They were not looking to hire somebody. I was not looking to join someplace. And, but one thing led to another. I thought they were doing something very interesting and I ended up joining them. And... At that time, they were still, this is pre Excel days. And I was the only like younger person in the team. There were four partners. I was a junior analyst. And, but I spent three years and things worked out well for me. I, at that round. And over time, I realized that India ecosystem will go through a lot of transformation. Uh, internet and tech boom is about to come to India. And I should be a founder again. So I left and started. And this was also the time I luckily in 2011, I met some delivery founders and I was the first agent in that company. So I had the fortune of uh, backing Clipkart through Excel and then delivery personally as an agent. Yeah. In 2013, me and Neha started Traction together. And but uh, the, the I, Traction was not your first venture, right? Tell yeah. me about your first venture. So in 2011, I started a e-commerce company called Advantage, which was into women lifestyle, sort of what Nika or Purple is doing. So it was a e-commerce marketplace. So we were selling all kinds of brands. And I think we raised money from Excel and Tiger. And then after two years, we started running out of money. So we ended up sending to Fashion and You. I was CEO of the combined company for a few months. And then I decided to step down and start this company with Neha. Being funded by Tiger and Excel at that time is literally 0.01% of startups would have had that privilege. <laughs> so what happened? So I think in 2012, there was a little bit of a downturn like we are seeing today. And we were not able to raise our next round. So we had raised uh, 2.25 million in the first round. And then uh, there was a bridge round of 2 million. And then we were starting to run out of money and market was really cold. This was the time when uh, GA gave a dump sheet to Flipkart with Broke. And Tiger was also looking to sell all their assets. So they actually sold a lot of companies during that period. And so this was like classic case so that we had a little bit of runway. We had a few months of runway and then there was a similar downturn and you get caught on the wrong foot. So eventually uh, we were fortunate that we were able to find them some exit. Otherwise, we would have to just shut down the door. Yeah. Is fashion and you still around? I don't think it's around. Although I anyone mean, prepared, it used to be a pioneer. Correct. I unfortunately haven't planned it so closely. So I... Probably knew about it for a year or two after the exit happened, but after that, I have not planned. And this is like nine years back, you know. So I met Neha in 2010 through a common friend. One of my contemporaries at IIT Kanpur was at Neha's team at BCG. And she had, uh, she was leaving BCG to join a venture fund. She had some options in front of her. And she was asking around if they knew anybody for reference checks and I, she ended up getting connected to me and we were few programmer turned VCs in the ecosystem. So we had a lot of common topic of discussion. And I think the genesis of Traction's idea happened during that period. So we were building some tools and doing our, doing our jobs. We were writing some code to automate some work that we were doing or we were building some database. And as we started talking, we started exchanging a lot of ideas. And over two years, between 2010 to 12, I think, there was a lot of discussion happening. And in 2012, actually Neha left her job to go to business school, but she came out a few months earlier and then started working on the uh, first idea that uh, was there. I was still running Urban Touch then, so I was not actually a co-founder then. And then she built first version of the tool and then we, she obviously realized that this idea is made for global markets, not just for India. So she went on to Stanford for her MBA. And after a year when my exit happened in 2013, when we actually went to US, we got incubated in Lightspeed US office and we worked there for four months uh, with some of their senior partners debating how to enter the market. And events is a big topic of discussion. How do you enter a market? Right? Eventually, if everything goes right, you can do hundreds of things, but how do you enter the market? It's like entering the chakra view, right? 
So you had to get that right. So we spent four months and then we came back with an answer saying that this is the way to enter. And for that, we thought it's better to come to India and build this company from here. So we actually closed on tractioning, came back to India, registered here and raised our first angel round here. And but what is the way? What did you want to decide so that this is the way? Yeah. So we, when we were talking to people, there were a lot of ways to think about it. You could enter through CRM. You could enter through, let's say, portfolio management tools. Uh, sector-based coverage was one of the things that people thought, uh, or people liked it. And then we also thought it was an interesting module from a price point perspective. So you have cybersecurity as a market. Now, as an investor, you want to invest in it. So you want to look at what are the top cuts in that market? What are the top companies? Can somebody scout and show me new companies in that market? So we set up a team which was just tracking cybersecurity. Okay. And so they would talk. Uh, what, what more basic question here? So you're saying like Bloomberg or Capital IQ are tools for people who are investing in publicly traded yeah. companies. Yeah. And you wanted to build something like that for private investors. So what is sure. the world of private investment? What kind of companies invest? Is it buying and selling of companies or is it startup funding, VCs or what? Like just if you can set out a lay of the land of private investing, what is private investing? So when you look at private investing, it's basically your VC funds, your PE funds who are essentially looking at private companies mainly for investment purposes. Right. So their workflow is essentially they would scout for interesting companies. They Once a company comes to them or they're evaluating a company that they have to evaluate the company, they have to look at who else exists within that market. It's an interesting market or not. What is the theme? Right. So they have to understand that. So that's the diligence part. And the third is basically when you are investing in a company, you have to do a portfolio management. You have to track the companies. You have to decide when do you want to exit the company. How does the market look like? Right. Etc. So that is your entire stack of private market from the lens of a private market investors, which are primarily VCs and PEs. And this is obviously global, right? If you look at the dollar spend, like US is a large market, India has now become very sizable market. And then YCA and Europe comes to, uh, continues to be one. So that's what was the uh, ratio of public investment versus private investment. So if you look at public total market cap of the companies, that's about closer to $100 trillion of market cap that you're talking about. If you look at private market, the private market AUM, for instance, is now has crossed six trillion dollars. Okay. So just so, so it's l- like less than one tenth of like okay, got it. Hmm. Yes. Got it. And if you look at the typical LP allocation, like an LP would allocate if you look at the endowment. So one word, you can also explain LP. At, uh, uh, sorry, uh, okay. So yeah, for probably. people who are so, not from right. the industry. So if you are a founder and if you have to raise money, you go to a VC if, to raise money. If VCs have to raise money, they go to LPs, which is called limited partners. Right. And the kind of LPs are varied. Examples of LPs include sovereign funds. For instance, a country has a lot of capital. They want to invest in different asset classes. That's a cla- that's a category of LP. Another very popular category of LP is your endowment funds. For instance, all these universities, especially in US, like Stanford, Harvard, Yale, etc., their whole institution is actually run by endowment funds. So they have a large endowment fund like Stanford is about $23 billion or so. Star- Harvard's is even larger. And uh, they invest across various asset classes and the fee, uh, and the returns that they get from that, about whatever, 4 to 5 percent, that goes into the running of the whole university. That's a classic example of endowment fund. So when VCs have to raise money, they typically go to endowment funds or these large open funds or the pension funds is another very large category of LPs. Yeah, correct. So if you look at it from the lens of an LP, a limited partner, right? How do they look at this asset class? So if you look at typical endowment fund, which is one example of a IP, they would have uh, that typical allocation. When we started a, a decade back, the typical allocation would be, say, 40% to public equities, right? Which is across US, uh, across emerging markets, right? uh, across all the regions. So 40% to public equities. And then your private equity, which includes VCP, would be about 4 to 5%. Right. So you're talking about one tenth, right? 40% is public equities, 4% is so private. What has happened now? If you look at a lot of this data is actually released by the endowment funds. How much is the allocation across the asset classes? Mm-hmm. Now that number has increased a lot. So for some endowment funds like Yale, it is actually your uh, private market allocation has increased even crossed the public market allocation. 
So it has become higher for some endowment fund. It's more than 20%. For some, it has also reached up to 40%, which I would say it's on the higher end. But it typically between 20 to 30% is a is now a ratio that you can see. So that is the other interesting thing that has happened in this market from where we started to now that uh, the overall market has also expanded. And you can also see the fact that right now, uh, even around you, some other data, for instance, when we started the term, Unicorn did not exist. Right? Unicorn actually got coined after our company got started. And that is also because of the fact that there weren't a lot of sizable companies getting created in the private markets. If you look at the, the same term Unicorn applied, even like in 2010, a number of companies that would have become unicorn globally would be like just one. And last year, there were more than 500 companies that actually became unicorn. Right? So that has been, even in India, that number uh, you know, now cumulatively has crossed 100. Just the size of companies in the private market and hence the investable assets have also increased. And uh, that is why you now see a lot more money, dollar also flowing into this market. At a broader level, someone must told me the reason why there is so much money in like flowing into private markets is because of the quantitative easing which the US did. I just want to understand what you think. Why is it that say these endowment funds from 4%, they are now at 40% in private equity investment. Why is this trend happening that there is more private markets are increasing? Correct. 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 So if you look at, so we obviously track this data very closely because this is what defines that. So we feel that if you look at even a longer period of 20 years, Public markets, uh, AUM has as if in the management has increased at 5 to 6 percent KGAR. And private markets have all increased at 11 to 12 percent KGAR. So it's not just recent. So and quantitative easing has happened in the last 12 years. But if you look at even 25 years worth of data, I think broadly speaking, private markets have generated higher returns for investors and then they are doing asset allocation. Obviously, when you invest in private market, there is a longer cycle. So in public market, I can buy and sell tomorrow. But in private market, once I invest, the money won't come up till mm-hmm. five to 10 years. So there is a, a liquidity issue or like uh, the uh, availability of trading options. Correct. That, correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. So hence, limited partners have to also define how much they put in. Otherwise, they will the entire investment will become illiquid. But over time, as they have seen better and better returns, the asset allocation has moved. So they will move every few basis points every year. And then over the last 20, 25 years, that asset allocation is increased. And this asset is not very old. Like some of the earliest venture funds are only like 35 year old. So this is right. very new right. asset class mm-hmm. in some ways. Mm-hmm. And for the first 15, 20 years, it was still very concentrated and very small. And for only the last 20 years, it has completely exploded. Mm-hmm. And that is why our finance or data company for this market is only created recently in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Most of the players in our market got started in the last 10 to 15 years. Okay. 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 You had the idea of traction as a data player for private investing. Were there any global comparables, like uh, any global company doing this, which made you feel this is feasible to do? So at that time, when we were starting, there were hardly, even today, because it's a vertical industry, there are globally, if you look at it, there are only about four or five players. But I think what we realized is the pain point is not solved. For instance, a lot of people provide you transactions data, like uh, good transactions data, which is there, or financials data. But what you need as an investor is you need to be looking at markets on a daily basis. There are new companies coming and pitching to you. You have to be, you have to evaluate the opportunity uh, in a couple of days time. So uh, what we started of building actually did not exist. And we more thought, we more saw the, the opportunity more from a market perspective that we, there will be a data platform, large data platform, which will be also created in the private market space. Correct. And when we were starting, we were thinking that these things should exist. If I'm looking at a company, I want to look at all the other things that exist in the market. We would actually just stylishly search Google or ask around to get new companies. So we started with saying there's something like this should have existed. And then I think over years, we realized that, okay, public market has a power or a definitive or a capital IQ. And hence, there is a parallel. But we didn't start thinking around a very from that side. We started thinking that we are investors and we are struggling to do these basic things and there should be somebody who's solving it. And over two, three years, when we figured out nobody's solving it, we started to take a stop at this problem ourselves. And over time, we built our thesis that how do you draw parallels to other markets and all that. But I don't think we started just looking at that parallel and started that. We just started primarily saying, Ki, I get a company, I want to see comms and there's no way place to look at it. Yet just doing manual scraping to do this job. And that's not a good way to do it. 
and he's just got built a lot later i think over years over uh, after he done a lot of progress okay so you started with cyber security tell me how you built up that one vertical and how did you get the data for it and how did you then sell it to how did you get sales for it tell me that okay. journey yeah yeah so for us i think discovering the first product to launch was a little bit non obvious right because in our market you didn't have a player you could say there's a crm that exists and let me launch a better version of the crm that did not exist that budget did not exist so that budget has got created in the last decade so for us to figure out okay which module do i enter for actually required like to work with a few customers and then define the module as well as pricing so the first as abhishek was mentioning the first module that we actually started off with is basically a sector based coverages and uh, we started with us as the market when i was doing my mba in stanford and we got incubated light speak so we spent about couple of months in figuring out the module and the pricing that we want to la- launch with so the first uh, sector so we started with sector based coverages as the first module and uh, we worked with the uh, funds in us because us was going to be a large market for private market investing and we worked with the funds and the corporates over there and uh, a very interesting thing is unlike in india if you if i look at india a lot of the in- initial investment was around in the consumer space whereas if you look at the, in us a lot of the people actually saw enterprise because they have made their money in enterprise they have seen the company scale and they feel it more predictable versus consumer which is a little bit hits driven at times right? so a lot of the initial set of customers that we worked with were looking at enterprise as the market and in fact even in enterprise the core infrastructure not the application layer the core infrastructure stack that they were working with so some of the sectors that we started off with is actually cyber security right coin which was way back a decade back iot was the other sector that we started off with and so the initial task was basically just build a good landscape of all the companies that exist anyone who's looking at it it should be very effortless for them to find out new companies evaluate new companies etc so for that we then started building a team in india who would then build the whole coverages and then we uh, continued to be in us for the initial quite some time and work with customer show the output see if it is interesting not interesting and then then we after we saw the we showed the output to the customers they were like delighted that was that was wonderful it also helped us in initially figuring out the pricing and starting the first paid customers so uh, that is also when we realized that okay wow that is i think the cycle has started that people are happy to pay the price and they are basically just asking us for more and more thing and we actually started off with a high price point of $5000 a month then eventually came down to $500 a month which is what is our current pricing what is what is the data that you collected on let's say cyber security like a list of companies their employee headcount their turnover like what all did you collect and how did you collect that So one of my jobs for instance when I was an investor one of one of my job if I have to look at the sector then I have to do a sort of a sector scan and what that means is essentially find out all the interesting companies that exist within say cyber security figure out what are the sub what are the different type of models which exist right someone is doing endpoint security someone is doing some network security there are various ways people catering to this market right what are all the islands what is basically your your taxonomy or the business model stack that exists within that market how are all the companies placed how competitive is each stack right and then you find out new companies that are coming up in that space so whenever you find out a new company you place it in that market map so that it's very easy for you to compare okay this company competes against this company so hence how interesting is this going to be okay and uh, like for the company per se you also look at like getting their revenue headcount and such yes. kind of data yeah so one is basically the company where what model it exists where does it place in the market map of cyber security the other thing is the information about the company how old is it where is it located how fast is it growing right what is its stage that it is in right all the metrics which helps you also figure out whether this is interesting for me for instance different investors have different stages of investment as well as some invest in early stage some invest in late stage some invest in a particular geography like i only invest in us and canada some invest in south asia help you define all these parameters to then see if their company is interesting or not and then obviously so in when you are evaluating a company you'd look at the uh, some of the metrics which is how fast is it growing what is the team what is their background etc plus you would also look at the other market metrics for instance what uh, which node is it falling into how competitive is that 
is that company likely to run into a, a existing dinosaur in that market or is it a large aggressive player or not helping mm-hmm. you evaluate mm-hmm. that whole thing and this is publicly available like there's revenue growth things like that or like how do you get that data yeah so currently so i'll give you the current now obviously we have a lot more data about companies so essentially we would get information from a lot of publicly available sources just you would go to google you would search for a company you would get information about the company right for the company talks about so that uh, we'll get that plus we also get information from the regulatory filing so we actually go to the various regulatory filing we get information about it right now i think the other thing is that if you look at user data it's going more towards privacy but if you look at company data it's go- going more towards in the direction of transparency so there is effort to have more and more information about company so that it can also help investment etc so you are able to get information about that yeah okay okay interesting this would need a lot of sectoral knowledge like insider knowledge about a sector if you were to create these different buckets within one sector that how many so from that one sector of cyber security how many do you cover today today we cover nearly 2000 sectors wow across all the industry okay so uh, how do you scale up the the insider understanding of a sector you had a lot of insider understanding that you needed to make it a relevant product for an investor like deciding that this is into end point security or this company is doing this and this is a the trending part of it and so on so how do you scale that up that insider understanding from one to two no that's a very good question and that's actually a core part of the org as well as the process as well as the platform that we have built so we literally want like a person to do a phd in one sector and in our case what has happened is that all these sectors are very new if i want someone to know about say bitcoin or web3 today or all these sectors there isn't a person who knew about it in a lot of detail earlier you anyways have to learn about these sectors afresh so we literally want like a person to do uh, spend a lot of time in in tra- in mapping the sector in understanding the co- companies and then they are able to do a call that this is an interesting model that we should cover within that space this is what the company corresponds to this is the business model of the company and the other the second interesting thing is that they do this globally so when someone is looking at within fintech payments they are looking at payments companies globally and not just in one geography so that they are also able to track any new themes which is coming up across any country even far off i think that is there and i think the third thing which we have done is obviously built a lot of tech to be able to do that we even are right now we actually track like more than half a billion companies at the back end and from there our platform actually throws up that this is the next set of interesting cyber security that we should look into today and so that platform has also become very intelligent over time which is able to mine a lot of data and then throw up the companies that among what a half a billion companies these are the next set of like 100 companies which we should look at and we end up uh, tracking about about like 50% of those well wow. so uh, i want to go deeper into these two things which you mentioned one is people like making them phd's into that and second is tech so l- let's start with people first how did you build your team how do you really create people who become phd's in in that domain which they are tracking so even if you look at our team today we have nearly 90 sector focus analyst team which is actually focused behind all the different sectors right and one of the key things is that when when someone has to when someone starts covering a sector there is a whole training which is there for them to become intelligent on the sector the second thing is that there is historical data which is there which is basically the coverages that we have on the platform which they are also able to learn and then figure out come to speed off that on that sector much more efficiently then what we the time that we used to take when we were investors now they can do that in a matter of a few days what took us probably a few weeks and then 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 so also the tech platform which constantly keeps bubbling up new companies which then they have to analyze they take a call whether this is interesting not interesting and then figure out again okay, what the company does tell me about the evolution of the tech platform you must have had version 1 platform which today must be like significantly better than that version one tell me that journey like what did you build what did you prioritize on building and so on yeah yeah so tech is basically a very important part of our whole traction i would say and quick background like both me and abhishek are actually com science undergrad so our first uh, our first inclination is that if we can solve the problem purely with tech can we do that or not 
then obviously we realized that it has to be much more curated enterprise rate etc but obviously we we did this proportional investment in the tech platform if, even if you look at that initial most of the dollars spent would be probably in building the platform that we had done an uh, upfront investment in and uh, because of the fact give me yeah. some like if you can paint a picture that this was mm-hmm. version one this was how primitive it was and this is what it is today i think initially if i were to look at it we would probably t- start tracking like it's on two things one is the number of companies that we would track on the back end so we we started with a few hundred thousand over time it kept growing today we are tracking more than 600 million companies on the back end so that is just the set of companies that we have tracked on the back end and obviously there's a lot more information about each of the companies that has also increased over time that's one. And the second thing I would say is just the on the data intelligence part. Earlier when we started, we could actually tell if this is an interesting company or not with a probability of, I would say, 3 to 4%. So in, in 100 companies, if we were to actually, our t- platform would say, we, the correct answer would probably be like a single digit percentage. Today, it's as high as 50%. Uh, so the platform has also become more intelligent because obviously a lot of data has gone into making it figure out what is that interesting set that we want to track. And, and this algorithm is also one of the core IPs, right? So it's not about just coding it. You have to feed in like millions of data points for it to come back and take you now accuracy is 50%. So the core doesn't change, but the underlying data of like conventional new machine learning, you have to feed in a lot of real human curated data for it to succeed. So it has taken us five years of data inputting to go from 2% to let's say 40% accuracy. But so I think that is also... Like, this is uh, 40% accuracy of saying that a company is interesting. Uh, what does this mean, company is interesting? Uh, so for instance, our probability of finding out if this is an interesting cybersecurity company to cover or not. Okay. So essentially, the insight of whether to mm-hmm. include in traction data. I'll give you an offline example to help you build a case. So if an investor is looking at a market, let's say you want to fund an ice cream chain. Like a single ice cream store is not exciting, but a chain which is let's say more than five stores is interesting. So by definition, 99% of the market is not exciting for you. Or if you look at cap companies, like there are a lot of small SME shops who run five, 10 caps. That is not exciting. But somebody who has thousands of caps, so 99% of the market is usually not attractive for an investor market. So a system has, you cannot say, I'll search for ice cream stores and then look at every ice cream store. So you have to do a lot more sig- build signaling around that and then say, okay, I think out of these, everything, these are probably 100 most exciting ice cream chains. And then earlier, only 3% of that would be interesting. Now that number is like 40%. So algorithms have learned a lot to say that this is most likely and company interesting which from an investor perspective or a firm company perspective. And so once the algorithm throws up companies, then there's a human curation. Yes. Somebody will. Absolutely. Somebody will look at it and say, oh, you do that. And again, every time you look at it, that decision goes back into the system and accuracy gets better. It makes it smarter. So in some ways, you are, like, it's a snowball, right? So eventually it will reach a point where you are highly accurate. What is your funnel like? This is pretty interesting what you said that 99% of the market is not worth covering in traction. So what does the funnel look like? Where do you get the mother data source, the, the larger data source from? And how does that get winnowed down to what you cover actively here? Just help me understand that. I think if you look at the market, public markets typically have 50,000 to 100,000 companies which are listed. And that if you go to all the exchanges, you can get the download immediately. And these are right. the listed companies. Yes, Private yes. entities are at like hundreds of millions. And out of that, investable segment is much smaller. So companies which are scaling, people want to invest in a company because they didn't scale or they have already attained a certain scale. And that universe is just very hard to find. And that is what you end up solving with this. And just to think about it, like if you look at ice cream stores, there are millions of ice cream stores globally. This data of entire universe you get from filing, like companies have to file uh, in the, like in India there's FDA or so similar so Fine, actually, you can start at multiple places. I think what we did was that when we started the company, digital footprint of the companies were exploding. And so 10 years back, when you had, if you could not have built this company 10 years back because then you would have to start with legal entities and that is a much harder problem to solve. When we started, like all meaningful businesses started to get digital footprints. You wouldn't find the large scale companies which probably don't won't want to have anything, any presence in digital. So people had websites, people had social media presence, people were posting jobs. 
So people were doing getting into news. So have, all the news was coming online. So there was so much digital footprint about companies that we started with digital footprints and then stretched it around the company. And then you use all these signals to say that this might be exciting. I'll give you a very trivial example to build a case. So for example, if you are a website which says that there is a checkout button, then there is a likelihood that there is a high likelihood that this is an interesting company for us to look at. But for that matter, if the company website says that are investors, then you know that there is a higher chance that this company is more exciting than a company which is not. So over time, we have built like hundreds of signals about each company, stitching to their all digital footprints, and then you can find it. So because we are starting in a digital era, we started with the digital footprints of these companies to find it. And that's why we are able to sit in India and actually cover companies across the board. Otherwise, you would have to have a lot more physical presence across the globe, and it would have been much harder for them. I think this company would have been much harder to build 20 years back than in uh, what is the tech you built capture digital footprint? Is, is it like what Google does? Like how Google is indexing pages constantly? Is it something like that you built to capture the digital footprint? So uh, I think we internally call it Google for companies. So I uh, yeah, want to talk about that. So the way yeah, Google indexes the entire web, we focus on indexing companies. So we don't want to index everything, all pages. We focus on saying that these are the company footprints or these are the key company footprints and we focus on that. So to give an example, if we were to let's say look at a particular website, we would just track their homepages more closely than let's say the entire front end of the website. Because homepage tells us enough for maybe one or two level deeper will tell us enough to judge as a human being that this is an interesting company or not. So that's what we end up doing. And I think the other thing is that we had to also invest a lot in technology because we started with global first as a problem. We didn't start with one country, let's launch for one country and then let's do another country. We actually launched the sort of the global coverage first. Yeah, and I think that is why also tech became like a key cornerstone of our entire infra. And also another some things that people actually don't realize is actually 70% of our revenue is actually outside India. So a lot of the people that I speak to say that, you know, okay, it's, uh, uh, you know, about the coverage. And we actually have customers in, for instance, Germany, looking at German companies through the platform in US, looking at US companies through the platform. Uh, and actually customers now span nearly 50 countries. Tell me the revenue journey. So you started, like, which was the first year when you made revenue? What revenue did you make that time? What was the pricing like? And yeah. how has that evolved? What is it today like? So we launched the platform in 2013. And at that time, we actually did a small engine round from people that we knew and fortunate to have had, obviously, a really good set of investors all along. So we raised the first angel round. Uh, we, the company actually turned profitable. And then we raised the first institutional round. And How much did you raise in each of these? So the first round was 90 lakh, less than a crore, first angel round. This was way back in, in 2013. And then the first institutional round, we got investors like Sachin Bini from Flipkart, Sai from Delivery as investors in the first round. And then we raised the first institutional round that was from Elevation, who was earlier staff. And then we also got opportunity to get very marking angel investors like this. And uh, so after the institutional round, obviously, then we started scaling. the. Uh, How much was the and, institutional uh, round? This was about three and a half million. This was like okay. the typical Series A check back then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And interestingly, after that, we didn't have to raise a large round. A lot of our, that is also because of the fact that we were enterprise. We are fairly cash efficient in that sense. So our total dollar raised till date is only about 17 million, in which we still have part of the round that we had raised in the last round still in bank. And we also turned profitable about a year and a half back. And this year will also, this year, like last year was also the first bad positive year. We also, we turned cash flow positive much earlier. So right now, though, obviously, it's a profitable company. We, are, we add cash to the treasury every, every month. All the growth, though, we, so if you look at just last 12 months, you would have been hearing a lot about downsizing, but we actually increased the team by more than 100 people. So today we are nearly a little over 800 people in all. And so I think all the growth has been, the business is able to like, uh, we are able to invest a lot of the cash back for us growth. What is the split of these 800 people like? How many in what function? So there are about 100 people in tech, which is across tech, product, automation, engineering team. 
about 150 members in in your sorry actually about 150 members in your go to market which is your sales marketing and then you have a large team of about 100 sector focus analyst team and then about 200 people again in another data operations which are across the various data modules that we have we have a lot of bunch of data modules for instance if you are looking at a company in UK if you want to figure out their financials their cap table etc we have a lot of data points so these are across. What is this data model? Sorry, this is like the core product, or is it different from the core product? No, this is the core. This is part of the platform only. So everything is basically part of the platform. In the platform, you have one is your sector-based coverages that you have, which is basically led by the analyst team, and then you also have a lot of data about companies, which is one of the points that you were alluding to earlier. For instance, if you're looking at one particular company, like favorite company, you want to look at what is its stage, where is it located, what is the previous downs that it has had, what is the valuation, last round valuation, what is the growth rate, etc., deep size, etc., all these things. So these are all the data modules that are also there about private companies, which basically then merge together to make it very actionable when people are looking at companies. Got it. Okay. Okay. Tell me about your go to market. How do you acquire customers? How did you get that flywheel started? Is it like, is your pricing like a single price point for the entire platform or are there tiers of access or is it like some geographical restrictions? I want to understand all of that. So I think initially, like most companies do, we hustled our way through, let's say, first 20, 25 customers. So Neha and me were doing sales. I was going to demos in India and Neha was doing sales in US. I think she spent first two years doing a lot of sales herself. And once and it was then momentum at that $5,000 pricing, this was at that time. Yes. Actually, so first, yeah. like by then, very quickly we came to 500. So 5,000 was there for the entire organization. Then we okay, focused okay. on business pricing. So we said, yeah, key, okay, $500 per nice and first seat is the pricing. Yes. So I think we moved from uh, account-based pricing to seed-based pricing very quickly. and uh, But I think most of our new customers were on seed-based pricing. And uh, after we had 20 or odd accounts, we knew that people are buying, people are happy to pay for this money and they'll not go away immediately. Then we started worrying about scalable playbook. And that time, I think there was a lot of buzz going around, around inside sales. And because we had large presence in India, we thought we will give it a shot. We started working remote sales teams. So there was some demand gen work, but otherwise they were giving de- demos remotely and then selling the product. And that scaled value, value for us. And today our entire sales is actually done from Bangalore slash India because before lockdown, we were all in Bangalore. So all the sales was done that. Now team is slightly more spread out. But theoretically, I can say that all the sales is being done out of that office in Bangalore. And that is something which is quite unique to us, which not many people have been able to scale. But for us, that playbook worked because Outside sales, we do a lot of content marketing. So we generate a lot of reports on these sectors. So for example, cybersecurity will rely out an annual report and which is very widely circulated among our customers. So a lot of these people have heard our name before they come and think about minor subscription. So because of this high brand, we see customers are comfortable buying online. And these are like medium-sized purchases, right? These are between $5,000 to $25,000 a year for contracts. So people are comfortable buying it online. And after that, our support teams work with them and expand the account. And so this was our go-to-motion strategy. How did we do marketing and sales? And I think on the pricing front, we were obviously debating a lot of things initially. Should we do report, pricing per report? Should we do all of that? But by then, we had started to realize that there is a panel for us. Public markets already have data platforms and we can learn a lot from their playbooks. So we saw that all of them do one platform bundled all broadly most of the module in the core product and then they do seed-based pricing. So we moved to that. So we started $500 per seat per month and then let's say subsequent seats are cheaper. So $1,000 a month give you three seats instead of two. And $2,000 a month used to give you seven seats instead of seven, six seats. So you do that some discounting for bulk buying, but broadly that was uh, our core pricing and we have stuck to it. I think last year we increased from $500 per seat to $600. But other than that, we have as a company, try to be more predictable for our customers. We don't want to change pricing too often. And so for first eight years, we had one pricing, which was $500 per seat for the first per month of first seat. And that is now six hundred. I hope we stay it for a quite a while now. And I believe as a customer, when I'm buying a product, I want a stable pricing so that it doesn't change and I don't have to relook at my financial composition every few days. So that's what we have been doing so far. Neha, anything you would like to add? 
No, I think, yeah, it, it covers all the things. Much less, much less. So essentially, you have already a lot of data and content so that you package it and use that as lead gen, like those yeah. reports, brand building and lead gen that like overall recall, uh, building recall yeah. and, uh, and your think, inside sales. Is- yeah, I think that is something that works really well. So for instance, if someone is searching for semiconductor reports, they actually come across some of our reports. We also have vertical industry newsletters. For instance, if you want to just stay on top of what is going on in short tech globally, there's a newsletter which you can subscribe to that uh, you can track all the news through. So these are some of the things that that we can do because we are a data platform and that is how we get a lot of leads. Got it, got it. Okay. And does your sales happen through like self-service, self-checkout, all of that? Or is it like assisted account yeah. managers led? So in our case, actually, most of our users are enterprise users. So they would want to understand, they would have a, typically have some of the queries, they would have a use case, they would have something. So they, we do have a call that you do before you actually start boarding the customer. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, yeah, I wish you were saying. And it also helps us explain them what the entire offering is. Because otherwise, if they do self-checkout, I think they can just look at one small piece and they would not adopt the entire product. So they are at there and they also want handholding and we also prefer to handhold because we are get an opportunity to send them everything. And then they sign contracts and they do annual, typically some are quarterly, largely annual. So they sign up annual plans and they renew every year. And I think uh, this is also a product where you need a lot of handholding when they onboard. So it's not as if you self-check out and you can onboard it. There's somewhat of learning curve. And this is also true for public market data platforms. So you want some account manager to come explain you everything. Like It's remote, but... They spend some time when they're onboarding. After that, also, they do regular checkpoints and make sure that they understand new things. And I think public market guys have done an exceptional work at teaching their customers new things because their products are significantly more complex than where we are. If we have to offer 10 things, they have probably offered, they have to offer 100 things today. So I think we had the luxury of learning a lot from them. And otherwise, it would have been much harder playbook to crack it on your own using first principles. So I think both on... By selling side, as well as on onboarding, we spend, want to spend a lot of time with them to make sure that they adopt it properly. Okay, okay. Now, I'm speaking as, let's say, as a layman when I'm searching for, let's say, funding of XYZ startup. Typically, I will see, say, a crunch base in the search result, which as a layman seems to be similar to Traxer. Right. What are the differences that they have a freemium approach where they will show you some data up front uh, and then if you want more data, then you have to become a paying subscriber. So why don't you also do something similar? Because you also have the data which they have. But if I'm searching for funding on whatever XYZ company name, generally it will be Crunchbase which will come there or your story or one of these types. So what is the strategy behind your choices to not do that? As I was, as as you were alluding to earlier, when we actually started, there were a lot of these transaction databases that would exist. Right. But for instance, if you if you are an investor, I think you still didn't solve my problem of either sourcing or diligence. So, yes. So probably for a very lightweight user, it, it is easy to qualify. And that and that is that probably might be sufficient. But if this is my day job and I have to this is my day job of constantly tracking all the things. If I'm a D2C investor, I have to constantly track all the brands which are coming up. I have to see what are the new areas in the brands are. So then it is more of an enterprise great customer. So we focus more for the enterprise use case, not for the lightweight. In fact, none of our users are actually even companies or or people are just looking at it are actually users. So our half of our yeah, investors and actually half is large corporates, which include 70 Fortune 500 corporations as well. Uh, it which should be there who are are actually, Yes, and yes. who are actually looking for business critical decisions. So for them, the uh, requirement of the data about companies about this is much more nuanced or much more detailed. So you're saying Crunchbase is largely transactional data and it's more of a B2C or a B2 Pro C, like a prosumer kind of. Uh, it's not that enterprise grade. So I think it became a lot more easier to understand when we looked at public market data companies as well. There is a lot of data available on Google Finance, there's a lot of data available on other kind of platforms, but your enterprise grade will rather pay 5x more but get like significantly higher quality and most of the times my customer doesn't come and tell me that okay can you reduce the pricing and get me one person lesser accurate data they all say you know charge me 2x i'm happy to pay more but give me more hyper data give me more comprehensive data 
So even in public markets, like the largest players are companies which are taking, like Bloomberg, we hear from people that it is closer to $20,000 per seat per year. So it is quite high, but customers happily pay and their revenue is closer to $13 billion a year now. People pay because that's what they need. And so I think if I'm doing mission critical work, I would rather pay and get good what I need rather than saving money there. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. You've been building traction for about a decade now. You told me that you are planning for an IPO. What, where do you see your journeys and traction's journey over the next couple of years or over the next decade? Where do you see it going? So as we as founders are actually, we are fairly excited about this market. We feel it's, it's a very deep market and it has just gotten started. Uh, and it is going to, if you look at the quality of companies coming up and everything that is happening, the quality of talent that this market is able to attract today than what it was able to attract like a decade back, we, our excitement is only increased. So we believe that this will become a large market and that is why we want to continue to build this. And one of the best ways that you can actually do continue to build the company for the next 40 years is actually to take the company public. There is a, there is an option of whether you should you want to run private or public. We feel that if you're running a public company, it's much more accountable. It's much more dynamic. That's, you can run it my, with much more systematic manner for the next decades to come. And that is why we had taken the call of then listing in The Paytm IPO didn't scare you off. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, we actually started the process earlier. <laughs> okay. And that's it. But I think it's, it is going to be cyclical. That is that is there. And even if you look at yeah, the whole markets. So that is one of the things that I also tell that there is going to be market cyclicity. For instance, the Fed increasing the rates or Russia going to war in Ukraine, you cannot predict it, but it is going to have an impact. So you should just let the small things. So what we say is that, you know, what, how uh, in public markets, you cannot predict what the next six months is going to be, but you can definitely predict what the next five years are going to be. Because if you are consistently building the company, if, you build, if your market is large, if you are having the whole tailwinds, which is also there and you are able to execute well, then you can definitely predict the next five years. Yeah, Abhishek, you were saying something. Yeah. And secondly, I feel that for companies... Uh, like going to public is next natural step. If you feel that there is a 40 year worth of growth in front of you and you have figured out your current, like your business is stable and it's growing linearly, I think you should go public. That provides the necessary discipline. It's like if you're an athlete, uh, your natural next step is to go and represent your country. Right? If you're a cricketer, you want to go and play for the national team. So going to public markets are like that. So I think we always thought that once we are mature enough, we will actually go and list ourselves. And so I think for most entrepreneurs, eventually it's when rather than if you should go public or not. If you look at all large companies globally, eventually large companies going public is the, the necessary condition to remain disciplined and uh, remain accountable. Okay. And tech companies haven't gone in India. Tech companies in India haven't gone public in fast. So that's why there is a question. But I think in the next 10 years, that will not be a question anymore. People will just assume that once you build a company, it's you reach the flow where you are growing rapidly and you are what you're doing, then you go and list yourself. But uh, currently, both of you are like holding the majority stake because you did not raise much. So probably you did not yeah. dilute much also. Yeah. So we are, we would fall in the traditional public companies have the promoter uh, kind of a title. So we would focus, which is uh, having some sizable stake. So yeah, uh, I think we continue to own. Yeah. Uh, so as per our findings, like, Outside ESOP, which is 10% or 10 10.9%, we own 41% and investors own 49%. And then on top of that, there's a 10 percentage plus ESOP pool that is there. Even though 70% of your revenue is global, you are like very Indian in your outlook, like planning to list an Indian market as compared to say like Freshworks, which listed in the US. So why did you choose to be so India centric? Correct. So I think when we were starting, we always had our eye on going public. We were at that time still sure India or US. And I think in the initial days, we met one of our advisors who also became shareholder later. So he was he mentioning that, look, you at some stage in your early life in company, you will have to decide, are you building it for m or are you building it for IPO? If you are building it for IPO, you have to worry a lot more about setting up processes. You have to be cognizant over your past structure. You have to build it. You have to build it assuming when you go public, everything is open to scrutiny and you will be able to you. Even you see that you have done a great job at building the company. And we got more serious about it. it we initially thought maybe after five to seven years down the road, we have to decide. But his advice came in handy. A lot of companies that he was on board, 
those companies had gone public and fast. So his advice came very handy at that time. And when you were thinking about that, you also thought that you want to list in US or India. We didn't know that that time at that time, but we knew that this is going to be a very, very cash rich industry because generally you are selling data to financial industry. Financial industry largely has been very rich. And we also knew that innov- innovative companies are the future, right? So most of the wealth creation is happening in innovative market as compared to mature markets. So we... And you had to do work with, as a model also again. The, the well, we market. saw that and we saw that this market should be ideally richer than that market. And so we intuitively knew that we are among the richest markets globally. And uh, India likes profit stories more. And that was the time when we thought that maybe if you want to list in India, you should come here and then. We actually registered in India. We, then we moved our entire thing. We closed the US equity and we started just working here. So we had our eye on going public very early on. We built our company, keeping that in mind from day one. So everything was systematic. We were very disciplined with how we, we set the processes that we had done. Our CFO was among the first, uh, maybe 10 employees in the company because we knew we you need a strong financial muscle and that person is still our CFO. So we planned everything accordingly and that drove a lot of our decision or how much discipline with which we run brand the company so far. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And just to add, I think we'll be among the first few, few SaaS companies to be going for listing in India. For instance, obviously a lot of the SaaS companies have been HQ'd in US or in Singapore, but we are a pure SaaS company, 100% of our revenue is subscription based and among the first few ones to be going for listing in India. Uh, there's that uh, famous ratio na, that VCs look at, which is CAC to LTV ratio. What is that like for you? That is very awesome for us <laughs> because we have a decently high price point and we are able to do insight things from India. Our CAC to LTV is more than 10, which is which is regarded as, no. as pretty good. Uh, but I think it's an unsafe comparison because those guys are doing LTV to CAC where the sales team is in US. So customer is in US and sales team is in US. There you have replaced the, your customer is still in US, but you're selling the sales from India, which is less than one tenth the cost. We, so, you don't have a single salesperson uh, outside India. Like actually, like, everybody was in Bangalore before the long term. Just like entire production, we are a unique company where entire production is in India and entire distribution is also in India. And uh, we found a way to make it work and now it's been great for us. Phenomenal. This is essentially like the product led growth approach where your product, which is the reports that you published, that the yeah. basically the research you're doing lets you publish good quality, unique reports, which help you get growth. Amazing. Right. Based on so many millions of data points that you're turning out and studying, what are some of the interesting trends that you are seeing? Like some future gazing, if we can do. It's a very I think broad question, I know, but so I'll tell you one of the most interesting thing that I noticed in last nine years. As an investor, you always used to say, you can't stop an idea whose time has come. Like, but it was like a motherhood statement. You wouldn't have data to back it. And actually, when we did analysis, we realized that because we group companies into taxonomy nodes, you could actually see mushrooming in the data. You would see that one idea suddenly, uh, for years, nothing happens. And then suddenly, two years, you will see 30 company founders look at that idea and start executing that. So we started seeing mushrooming first, and it was so exciting or like how. Uh, <laughs> so it was pretty really amazing to see that the data first and that mushrooming is real. People across the globe are able to see the same idea same time because the markets have something has changed in the underlying market because of which a lot of people together think that this is possible to build today. And that was the most amazing thing that I noticed in my nine years. Say in short, like, I, like there is an explosion of companies which are doing yeah. uh, insurance for employers. Correct. So, yes, absolutely. Employee insurance is a great example. Like everything, suddenly for 50 years, nothing happened. And then in the last three years, everything happened at once, right? So <laughs> Similarly, you can see in even the other ones, like like uh, space tech, there weren't a lot of companies. There are companies there. There are companies which are, even in data, they are tracking satellite data through that. So there are a lot of these nodes. So right now we actually have this view on the platform wherein you can actually track emerging nodes. So you can track where the mushrooming is happening in a particular industry. If you like the Founder Thesis podcast, then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing, technology, career advice, books, and drama. Visit thepodium.in, that is T-H-E-P-O-D-I-U-M dot I-N for a complete list of all our shows.